Welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. If you're watching us on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and your faithful host, Josh Bertram, had a power outage, so he can't join us today. But with us this week, we have Patrick Ruffini. He's a Republican pollster and one of the country's leading experts on political targeting, technology, and demography. He's a co-founder of Echelon Insights, a polling and analytics firm, and has advanced the digital and data-driven transformation of American politics in numerous roles over nearly 20 years. Um, he began his career working as working for President George W. Bush, including roles at the RNC, um, his re-election campaign, and in his administration. And from 2005 to 2006, he was the lead digital strategist for the RNC. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, um, he's uh, he's published in Washington Post, 538 Political National Review, and has been all over TV. But he most recently came out, came out with a new book. Um, it's called Party of the People, Inside the Multiracial Populist Coalition Remaking the GOP. Here it is for those that are watching us on YouTube. <laughs> and and uh, we're just so delighted to have him here on the show. So welcome to the show, Patrick. Thank you, Will. Yeah, so I guess uh, just to start us off, how, like, Tell us, like, why or what what led you to want to write um, the book Party of the People, um, especially kind of in the context of everything going on? Yeah, I mean, I think that this was an idea that started for me back in 2020. And um, in particular, just uh, coming off of 2016. So I was one of the pollsters with egg on their faces after the 2016 election. And so I wanted to uh, really take a step back, assess um, both where my industry had gone, what my industry had gotten wrong, what I had gotten wrong, um, and um, take a look also at where I thought things might be going. So at the time when I was first thinking about the idea, I wasn't sure that all of the things I talk about would come to fruition, right? I mean, we had seen in 2016, a really, really surprising election result in terms of Trump getting elected uh, despite losing the popular vote by two points because he did so well with these white working class voters in the upper Midwest. I mean, that was really uh, the thing that um, people missed, um, the, the wave of voters that people missed. Um, but, you know, it, it seemed like there were tentative signs, you know, even going into 2020 that uh, Donald Trump was doing better with Hispanic voters, that he might have been polling a little bit better with African-American voters, uh, even despite the, uh, you know, kind of the turmoil and the protests of summer 2020. But I thought that was really interesting. And I thought that, you know, we could see a coming together of those two groups that, you know, I think most people would say are opposed in their, uh, you know, kind of political or both their political orientation. Um, but just in terms of how people characterize the 2016 election as sort of this what you know kind of white racial backlash, right? And mm -hmm. that didn't seem to entirely make sense to me. So uh, fast forward to the 2020 election results, and you see Trump actually does better in these communities. And I thought, well, this this seems to be there, there seems to be some there seems to be something here. So it was full steam ahead uh, after the 2020 election, and you know we're almost at 2024. And it doesn't seem like this trend has, has really let up. Um, you still see, I think, Republicans doing better even in the 2022 midterms um, among diverse audiences in a way that they really hadn't for you know decades leading up to this. Mm, that's interesting. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by um, what your book says and kind of in, and especially just what you just mentioned and can't help but wonder how, how much of this is just like a... Um, I don't know, a response or, you know, is attributed to the the growth and opportunity project, you know, back in 2012 or 2013. And and this is kind of a, a side note, like and I just had a Trump moment where I just realized growth and opportunity projects is GOP. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Trump, Trump just recently just realized that us and US are the same thing. So I just had a Trump moment. But but yeah, I'm curious, how, how much of it do, do you think is attributed to that? So it's very interesting. So back in uh, what you're referencing is the uh, so-called Republican autopsy following the 2012 election in which, um, you know, Republicans all of a sudden have this come to Jesus moment where they realize that uh, we can't keep losing 
um, groups that are growing as a part of the electorate. We can't keep losing Hispanic voters. We can't keep losing African American voters. We can't keep losing Asian American voters. And so uh, there was this brief moment in which they said, uh, you know, and, and really kind of party leaders came together to say, yes, we're going to pursue policies like comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, and that broke down pretty quickly. Right. Once there was, I mean, there was a backlash within six months. I mean, that was, that all fell apart. Um, and then fast forward to 2015 and Donald Trump kind of walks down the golden escalator, says Mexicans are rapists, um, says all of these things. So it says all these nasty things about these groups and people like mm -hmm. me are like horrified, right? Because, you know, we believe that like, okay, the party does need to move in this direction, but he goes and does the complete opposite. And the surprise is that he wins, right? And he wins not, maybe not with a huge surge of support uh, within these groups that he was kind of railing against, but he didn't do any really much worse. He didn't do worse than Republicans passed. And, um, you know, there was a sense like maybe some groups had moved a couple points in his direction, which was, I think, a bit of a, a surprise to most people, let's say. Yeah. So that was part of um, kind of the irony that you have a candidate who is disparaging, right, uh, it, these, uh, you know, Mexicans, all sorts of, of groups coming into the country, right, mm -hmm. immigrants saying build the wall. And yet he doesn't do any worse with Hispanic voters in the 2016 election. Yeah, which is really weird. <laughs> and, and so so do do you think do you think uh the Republican Party as a whole learned from the autopsy report or was Trump just, you know, just this weird outlier? Yeah, I mean, I think that that is dead and gone. I mean, it's dead and gone, right? I mean, now it's the the entire party has been transformed into uh really singing from Trump songbook on these issues, right? Uh, you know, everybody is um, kind of four square uh, united behind, uh, you know, I think Trump's immigration policies, particularly what, what we're seeing on the border right now. So that is one, that is one aspect of, of this. Um, so I don't think there's very much of the autopsy that lives on. But what's interesting in my own polling, because I've done polling in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, with Hispanic specifically, and there is no group that is right now stronger in favor of building the wall and more security down at the border than the people who are directly experiencing it. And I think that's a disconnect, right? I mean, I think people thought, like in 2016, people thought, how could that be, right? How could that be? Um, and now it's, uh, you know, we're kind of seeing the consequence of uh, you know, what has been a more open border policy. And you're seeing particularly groups that, you know, were thought to be uniquely motivated by, you know, you know, you know, Democrats really banking on this idea that Hispanic voters would be motivated by immigration the same way that black voters were, you know, historically motivated by civil rights. And that just did not turn out to be the case. Um, and I think we're seeing that play out right now. Yeah, I think you're right. So I guess the 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 quintessential question is why? Like why why are we seeing um you know many uh, folks in the minority who have traditionally in and as you argue in your book have you know almost um emphatically voted, you know, Democrat for I don't know past several decades. Um like what's what's the thing that's kind of switching uh for for them? Well, I think it's a you know, when you actually look at the main dividing line in our elections right now, it's not race, it's education. So we used to be, I think, um, you know, race and ethnicity um, was a very significant factor. You know, particularly in the elections in southern states, um, but even in northern cities, that there was a bright dividing line between in a city like Chicago, between urban precincts with a lot of African Americans and the suburbs, which were ruby red. Um, and, um, you know, you really had that both suburban white working class um, 
you know, that was opposed to, you know, kind of the agenda maybe coming out of big cities, right? I mean, and, and, and there was a stark divide. You look at maps in like 1984, 1988, and it's just super clear. Um, now the divide is education and it's place and density, right? So those suburbs are not really, are sort of this extension <laughs> of the city. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. You're seeing more, I think, racial diversity, I think, in the sense of racial diversity, in the sense of less residential segregation. Uh, you're seeing people live in, I think, closer proximity to one another. And in those places, um, you know, you are seeing, you know, particularly like the folks in the inner suburbs are more democratic right now than they were uh, way back in the 1980s. Um, and really the divide has become increasingly education, rural red versus urban blue uh it just to, to collapse that and urban mm -hmm. and suburban increasingly blue now um what happened in particular in 2016 is you had this huge divide open up among whites by education so you had w white non-college voters uh, in states like ohio michigan uh, pennsylvania all all those states kind of go you know go way to the right and you had this countervailing shift among whites and sort of closer in suburbs uh, who are college educated um, move all the way to the left. And that netted out to the benefit of Donald Trump because that is an electorally stronger position to be in both hmm. in the sense there are more non-college voters in the electorate than, uh, than, uh, than college educated voters in the electorate. Um, so it's a stronger position. That's one of the major things I argue in my book that that, that this is regardless of you're going to see shifts on both sides, but um, you know you want to be on the side with more working class voters, right? Yeah. And I think in 2020 that added, you know, you added, uh, I think the mentality I think of a lot of these voter groups uh, are pretty similar, right, in terms of how they view the world. Um, so you look at non-white working class voters. I think in many ways have a lot more in common with white working class voters than they do with white college educated voters who are very liberal and progressive. So if you look at the results of democratic primaries, right, where um, you really see a stark divide between moderates uh, in the democratic party and African-Americans and to some extent Hispanics siding oftentimes with a more moderate candidate in Democratic primaries and oftentimes, um, you know, college educated white voters in big cities and gentrifying areas siding with a more liberal or progressive candidate. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's kind of the fundamental divide that's kind of opened up where you do see more of a, a shift right in some of these communities, not enough to make them Republican groups just yet, but enough to I think bolster, you know, what I would call the multiracial populist coalition um, that we've seen in the last election or two. You know, so this is kind of just a tangent question, but I, I, I have to ask you because you're a pollster, like, why do we group things like, like yeah. by race, cut like education level, you know, yeah. all the yeah. different permutations um, when we're polling people? Yeah, I mean it's super interesting, right? Because in some in some in some cases, education matters. In some cases, it doesn't, right? And mm -hmm. you know, I would argue that historically, like some things have historically not mattered don't don't matter until they do. Yeah. So I think part of the issue is with polling in 2016 was that nobody really thought much of this education divide prior to. 2016, because um, at least among whites, and I think there's sort of been a, a, an acknowledged sort of, we need to kind of treat white voters without degrees differently than white voters with degrees. It seems to be kind of a shift that's been happening since the 60s. But when you look at 2012, there was absolutely really no, much, no really major divide. I mean, there was a slight divide between those two groups. Um, and that blows open in 2016 now what happens right um i think with the polling specifically uh you had basically the pollsters just kind of ignored kind of education as a variable so they kind mm -hmm. of underweighted non-college voters and they didn't really map it didn't map because it didn't matter they didn't pay that much they didn't pay that close attention to it and a lot of the data sources about uh you know a lot of the data sources were also pretty flawed right frankly uh, about um you know how many of these different groups were represented. So 
um, you know, part of the issue in 2016 was you weighted, uh, you know, you, you kind of underweighted this white non-college electorate. Um, what's interesting is that, you know, among voters of color, uh, there really isn't very much of an education divide at all, right? I mean, you're maybe starting to see one in some communities. I would argue maybe you're starting to see it with Asian American voters, but it's nowhere near what you're seeing among white voters. Um, and I think that's a very significant. Um, and the shift has been, and, and it's why I group things the way I do, right? The shift has been um, among all Hispanic voters, to some extent among all African American voters, a shift right. Not just whether, regardless of college education or not. Among white voters, though, it's really been a shift right among college educated, sorry, shift, shift left among college educated voters and a shift right among white men college voters. Yeah. So, um, like I, I, I kind of understand that, but, but I'm, I'm curious though, like, so, so whenever I read polls, whenever I, you know, listen to people repeat kind of where the country's at there, there, there tends to be groupings. Um, and I don't know if the groupings of, you know, you got non-whites, you got blacks, you got you know, like yeah. college educated, like who came up with these, these silos or these categories and like, why are why are those the the you know the metric <laughs> that 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 we we group people in? Because I just feel like people are just so diverse, like outside of just yeah. you know college and race and and whatnot. Yeah. It definitely is an oversimplification, right? I mean, and, and and it's not even. I think some of the groups you mentioned, it's not even the worst offenders. I mean, you have every election. There's a buzzword of the, you know, in, you know, there was once, you know, you're talking about soccer moms or you're talking about <laughs> yeah. suburban women, or you're talking about different groups. And that I would argue, I mean, a lot of times I would argue these are not meaningful distinctions at all, like anymore, or they're not relevant anymore. Right. I mean, it, it, you know, and just like kind of what I was talking about earlier, like something that matters a lot in one election can be the next election be, you know, it doesn't matter very much at all. Um, so I do think that it's this, you know, I, I think people need to kind of collapse these things to feel like they better understand them. But you're right. There's just a lot of underlying complexity that these simplified groupings don't get at. Yeah, I want to I want to see a poll that that gauges how like um, people that support Marvel and people that support DC like comics vote. Uh, cause I'm, I'm definitely in the Marvel camp personally. Um, so, you know, and I, my, my voting record does tend to lean more left. So I'd, I'd be curious if there's a, a nexus. So, you know, if, if you can, if you can look into that, that would, that would be awesome. Uh, I think a lot of people have looked at, I mean, to be serious about this. So a lot of people have looked at musical, I mean, music preferences and things like oh. that as hmm. actually, like people said, that actually predicts, you know, uh, you know, heavy metal fandom, I, I, it might be heavy metal, but it, it's something like that. So somebody has made the argument that that, um, you know, somebody took big data, right, of where people are listening to certain music types, and that actually does a better job of, than education of predicting, <laughs> like, weird. shift to Trump, right? I mean, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, I want to know where, where my ska, where my ska uh, folks are. Uh, but, uh, okay, so so you know, in your book, you you did address this, um, you know, this growing population of non-whites, um, you know, within the country. So you know, I, I think you said in your book that by like twenty forty five, that you know, we're going to be a minority majority um, and in America. So, so how much, how much of your data factors in that just, you know, the, the growing populace in America is becoming more multiracial. And as a result, like we're naturally just going to have a larger pool of people that, you know, are going to vote, uh, with the Republicans. Yeah, it would, it, that is, uh, that's just, uh, something that I really want to get across because I, I do think that, Republicans to some extent have their blinders on when it comes to this reality that they've made gains in recent elections, but to some extent it's a race, right? Can they close the gap fast enough to account for the fact that their traditional segments of the electorate are getting smaller? Um, so I think that to some extent these things are tied together and that is part of my argument that, um, 
you know, the fact that you have a multiracial electorate, you have a more diverse electorate means you can't have that without a lot of people in these diverse groups who maybe used to be underrepresented in the past or used to be more economically impoverished in the past. You can't also have that without a lot of people rising into the middle class, a lot of people kind of making their way up the economic ladder. And as they do that, their priorities change, right? Um, you know, particularly we've seen among Hispanic voters as, as they move up the economic ladder and they have seen really tremendous gains in their economic fortunes over the last few, uh, you know, decade or two, um, that their, I, I think to some extent, the mentality shifts from, you know, we are the outsiders, we are sort of fighting through the political system to get what we can. And they're like, well, we're now, th we've made it. We're now thoroughly embedded within this American mainstream. And as a result, that doesn't necessarily mean they all become Republicans overnight. That's not the argument. The argument is simply that they're kind of just voting like, they're swing voters, right? They're sort of the average of, uh, you know, they're not really defined by racial categories. I also think a lot of this growth is in, um, you know, multiracial is right in the title. But a lot of this growth is for people who are not any one thing. And as a result are, you know, I think, uh, you know, we have less residential segregation. We have less balkanized communities. And, uh, you know, again, you, you have this sort of, would say a, a regression to the mean politically. Uh, where people are just going to, you know, a, a lot of these very hyper-polarized racial voting patterns are going to reduce themselves over time because uh, people are living closer together, starting families together, um, doing more things together. And as a result, I mean, I think they're less polarized along a racial dimension, even as they're more polarized along maybe an education dimension or an urban-rural dimension. So I think that that's part of what's happening. But I do think this is not all sunshine for Republicans because, you know, I, I mean, I think they do have to grapple with the fact we have to continue. And I say this as we because I'm a Republican pollster, right? But um, they do have to continue, right, as a as a key priority, these gains. In 2012, going back to the autopsy, people were like staring down the sort of majority minority future and saying, where do we even start? Now we started and we need to as Republicans continue. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm curious. <clears throat> so I'm, um, my mom is Vita beans. My dad's black. Um, my kids are, um, some, uh, mixed as well. My, my wife is Polish and Italian. Um, so, I mean, like, you know, my, my, my kids are basically a melting pot of America. Right. So like, I, 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 I often struggle sometimes when, uh, you know, we were asked to fill out forms and then, you know, they asked the ethnicity question. I'm like, I have no idea. Like, I'm just going to check all the boxes, you know, <laughs> and, and let them kind of figure it out. So I guess what, what, what issues do you think, um, you know, you may have as a poster, you know, for sort of the next generation when you're trying to figure out like where people stand, um, and you're trying to divide people by, you know, ethnicity um like like how how difficult is that going to be for for folks like yourself yeah so i think that's that's a super interesting question because uh you know a lot of these projections of we're going to be a majority minority country really rely on uh, corralling everybody who it's kind of the inverse of that noxious one drop rule right every mm -hmm. you know if you're one drop minority you count as minority. And this isn't mm -hmm. like the old segregationist saying, this is the US census mm -hmm. today, basically kind of collapsing, looking at things in that way. And as a result, most demographers are looking at things in that way, but the reality is a lot more complicated um, for a lot of people, right? I mean, it's not everyone's going to make sort of an individual decision as to which community they belong to, if they even belong to one. Hmm. So, so I, you know, I have lots of friends that are black or Hispanic and, and, um, 
a few of them voted for Trump. They're like team Trump, Trump train, you know, and, and, uh, one friend in particular, and if he's listening, he'll know that I'm talking about him, um, who is an ex, uh, special forces guy, him and his whole family, super Trumpy. Um, I always poke fun at him all the time about it, but, but like, like, is it, is it Trump? You think that's sort of, you know, changing the demography of our political landscape or is it the republican sort of establishment like if we were to replace trump yeah. with you know desantis you know like would yeah. would things be the same or would they be different so i think trump was a catalyst absolutely in the way that he polarized the electorate was a unique but um it's something we've seen before a few times i think you go back to the 1960s 19, early 1970s and the re reaction, the backlash to the Vietnam era counterculture, uh, right? That you did see a, a shift among working class whites that were defined differently then because no one really went to college, or very few people, relatively few people went to college back then. So it's not in college versus non-college, but kind of low socioeconomic status. So you did see, you know, working class whites kind of surge into the Republican Party or surge away from the Democratic Party, which then had perceived to have had a lock on those voters. And then you fast forward to, but that doesn't, you know, th that advances, that doesn't really reverse itself that much in the intervening years. Then you go over to 2000, um, which turns out to be a pretty pivotal election when it comes to some of this, uh, some of these divides in terms of the urban rural divide red versus blue really starts to be a big deal and the divide gets even bigger it inches forward and then 2004 2008 2012 not much happens right things stay pretty stable 2016 it blows open and 2020 mm -hmm. kind of it, it's kind of continuing on that trajectory so i think he's a catalyst but i think we are at a new baseline and I think in the, I, I think it's likely that he, you know, is the Republican nominee, but should he not be the Republican nominee? I do think that um, a DeSantis or a Nikki Haley would benefit from a lot of the coalitional changes that he has made to the party. And will you know, I think retain, I think we will retain a lot of that. We'll also probably do but somewhat better in the suburbs, right? I mean, I think it'll actually be net, it would be net positive for Republicans if, you know, they were to nominate someone else. I don't think they will, but um, I think it would be a net positive um, because they'll probably gain back some of those voters that they lost. But I think they'll keep the vast majority uh, that I think uh, the gains Trump made. Yeah, you know, I, I've, I've been saying a lot um, to friends and conversations I've had with others is that, you know, I think if Trump is the the nominee, I think he'll lose. Um, but I think that if like Nikki Haley were the nominee and say she picked somebody like Tim Scott as her VP, Republicans would probably win because I, I think that Democrats are, are if nothing else, um, ideologues and would love to have a woman president. <laughs> and, and, and she could probably pull a lot of Democrat voters, especially with the unpopularity of, of Biden right now. But you know, that's, we don't necessarily have to get into any sort of punditry or anything like that. But uh, I, I, I am curious, though, in your thoughts on why, why you think, um, you know, people of color um, have coalesced around the Democrat the Democratic Party, um, because I mean, like I'm a Democrat and and I I often get really offended when people are like, oh, you know, you can't be a black Republican. I'm like, of course you can. Like historically, like that makes more sense, you know, to me personally. Like, I just know the history, <laughs> you know, like it, it makes less sense for me to be a Democrat knowing kind of what the origins of the Democrat Party were, you know, but um, but I, I'm curious on your thoughts about, you know, what why why it does the Democrat Party seem so attractive um, to say folks like myself and Hispanics and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's a lot of history there, right? And, you know, it, it particularly look at what has happened in the African-American community. There was a huge shift in the mid-1960s towards the Democratic Party as the positions of the parties uh, as it relates to civil rights or as it relates to voting rights and things like that, particularly in the South, where ch per the perception of that was changing pretty dramatically. So you go back to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, more Republicans as a percentage voted for that than Democrats did. 
because the Democrats were at the at the time a very southern party. But essentially, they killed Democrats killed off their southern wing um, in exchange mm-hmm. for you know kind of gaining right more African American voters. Um, you know, you no longer really have a Democratic Party in many areas of the South. There is no that, that is no longer that is viable in any real way. Um, so I do think that that is a very unique story in that the unity around the Democrats has been uh, pretty strong uh, historically. And as you you mentioned, you talk about this idea of you get in trouble for talking about black Republicans and things like that, that that really is the, um, you know, you really see it's it's less about policy, right? It's more about this sense of, you know, we have to stick together because of historically what happens when we don't stick together? Like, I mean, I, th- I do think, and that's a very unique situation. Now, when it comes to Hispanics, I think it's very different. It's a very heterogeneous community. You have Cubans, you have Mexicans, you have Puerto Ricans, you have people from different nationality groups. And I think Democrats have made a mistake to try to adopt this template that really worked really well for them uh, with black voters to Hispanic voters when uh, they really, there really isn't much of a sense of pan-ethnic identity, let's say, uh, with Hispanic voters. So you have some communities, and like Cuban Americans, who've leaned to the right. You have some communities, like Puerto Ricans, in places like New York, lean to the left, or Mexican Americans in California lean to the left. But it really is specific from community to community, right? Um, and in what their political leanings are going to be. But it's that that has also been true throughout our history, right? And so I, I think a big argument that I would make is that's changing um, because you've often had immigrants come into the country and be, uh, you know, you know, and sort of coalesce around one political party to, uh, you know, make sure that they have some form of political power in the country. And that's just becoming becoming less relevant if uh, you move out to the suburbs, you know, you're part of this multi pan-ethnic, multi-racial mix, and it doesn't really matter to you as much uh, that I need to get what, you know, uh, as a member of a, of, a, of, a, of a racial or identity group, right? Um, I need to get what I, you know, what I just justly deserve, right? That's just no mm-hmm. longer part of the calculus anymore. That's interesting. So um, in Chapter 10, you, you, you wrote you wrote about black politics. So I'm, I'm curious if maybe you can talk a little bit about about black politics um, and some of the stuff that you found. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, look, I'm not I, 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 I had to do a lot of learning on this one. Right? <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, that was something. And I do think that there is, um, you know, I, a big shout out to um, this book by Cheryl Laird and Ismail White uh, called Steadfast Democrats. Um, And they, I think, make a very clear argument for why uh, the voting pattern is what it is and why it's come to be um, and why it kind of stayed, it has stayed pretty cohesively democratic. And again, it's more about, again, this sense of, um, you know, we needing to stick together because of the perception that you don't, then, you know, you're going to have situations, uh, you know, like, you know, you know, segregation or, or, or things like that, that you know, we need to stand up, particularly in this atmosphere of, okay, if we're voting together as a block, we have an opportunity to elect more of our candidates from our community, right? So I think that that is, um, that's really been the driving force. But you actually look at the politics and sort of the ideological leanings in Black America, and they're not a whole lot different than the rest of America in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of where they stand on policy issues. But that doesn't mean that doesn't translate and hasn't translated to voting for Republicans. Now, what's changing? Because I make the argument that, like, you know, the Republicans did a lot better among Hispanic voters. You look at, at neighborhoods like Little Saigon or uh, these Asian American communities, they've done a lot better in recent elections among uh, other diverse uh, diverse groups, right? But they've done only a little bit better, right? Trump gained a couple points in 2020, gained a couple points in 2016. I mean, it wasn't very much, 
it made the difference in a lot of close states. So in Michigan, definitely mm-hmm. made the difference. Um, it made most of the difference in Pennsylvania. You go state by state. Um, I mean, you're also seeing, I think, in the in the sense also, uh, black voters being less enthused about voting for Democrats, mm-hmm. particularly post Barack Obama. So I think the big another big part of the equation has been turnout and the ability for Democrats to galvanize the black vote as they have kind of started to count on and they can't really count on it mm-hmm. anymore. So even in a state like Louisiana, there was a recent gubernatorial race um, where I think the Republican candidate got upwards of, you know, may have gotten upwards of 20% of the black vote, um, but also with low turnout. Um, so as a result, you know, you, you know, the Republican was able to really win without a runoff. Um, you're seeing a, a few more examples of that. Um, you're seeing, you know, particularly in the midterms last year, um, you did see, it, particularly outside the South, um, you see Republicans get up to 15, 20% in a lot of places. Mm. Um, and you're seeing younger Black voters in particular, um, the polling in particular around younger Black males is interesting. I mean, that is, you've seen support levels get up to 20, 25%. Specifically, there, black women were kind of remain very united in the Democratic camp, but younger black males are starting to uh, migrate or being a little bit more diverse politically. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, I mean, because I can, I can make an argument why the Republican Party, um, policy wise, you know, can benefit many in the African American community. And I, and again, I say that as a Democrat, like because um, I'm. I'm a former military. I was in the infantry, um, very pro gun. Like a lot of people are surprised. Yeah. I, I, I have like my progressive bona fides, but like I am kind of pro gun <laughs> and like, um, and what I tell people is that, you know, Republicans push for two way and, um, just, you know, gun ownership. Um, you know, what gets lost in, I think the broader national conversation is that if you are living in the South side of Chicago and like the police response time isn't very like quick like you want to be able to own a gun <laughs> just to protect yourself i mean you're you may not be you know bring it around to the grocery store and the libraries or whatever but like in your home like that's your protection because law enforcement isn't isn't like going to be coming as quickly as they may in some other neighborhood so like what what are some other you know republican type of policies that you think are attractive or 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 should be appealing to, you know, minority populations within America. I mean, I think that the real challenge there is how do you build intergenerational wealth? Um, and that has been a huge mm. challenge in the African-American community, especially. Um, and so I talk about uh, proposals towards the end of the book, because a lot of intergenerational wealth is um, when you actually count things like Social Security benefits, the promised value of Social Security benefits, um, you know, black citizens are really losing out lower because of lower life expectancy um, on um, a lot of tapping into that future wealth um, because that is a really kind of the primary source of net wealth in the African American community is a sort of future value mm-hmm. of retirement benefits. Um, so, you know, thinking about, um, you know, specifically how do we make that system work better? Um, you know, there have been proposals made to, you know, potentially allow people to tap into part of that and pass that along to their children, right? Um, obviously, you know, entitlements being a huge challenge. Um, but I think with the economy right now, I think that that is really been kind of a major factor for why uh, Black uh, approval of Joe Biden is so tepid. Um, you know, you're seeing maybe approval ratings in the high 50s, low 60s, and that's far short of what, you know, he would need to get. And I think partly it's it, it's an economic and inflation focused, um, you know, movement right now um, where people are not really seeing the benefits of so-called Bidenomics and um, mm-hmm. really prioritizing Things that will help people get ahead. Um, yeah, I, I I look at a thing like, uh, and this is kind of a little bit of an under the radar issue, um, but I, I look at things like the Green New Deal, or I look at things like all these green economy investments, 
that I don't think that working class voters across racial lines think is going to benefit them, despite the rhetoric about all these green jobs, because I think they look at these things and say, this is just going to make things even more expensive than they are. Mm -hmm. It's going to potentially cost jobs in traditional industries uh, that, you know, many African-Americans and Latinos have relied upon. Um, so I think that that is an under the radar issue, right? That I think if Republicans, uh, you know, how do we figure out how to get smart about messaging on those, um, those particular issues? Yeah. You know, um, cause as, as one that, that does care about the environment that, you know, does believe that climate change is real, like tackling those problems, isn't going to help put food on my table tomorrow. Um, so I, I definitely agree. And I, and I think that especially with, with Biden's, um, overwhelming black support, especially like in South Carolina and how Jim Clyburn really helped, you know, kind of push him over, over the line. Like if, if you are a black South Carolinan, you're like, okay, what have you done for me lately? Uh, <laughs> because like we're spending all this money and everywhere else in the country and the world, but, um, I'm not necessarily doing any better than I was four years ago. So, um, yeah, I, I, I definitely see that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about, you know, your, your thoughts and if, if any of your, your research has, um, revolved around just people of faith, um, especially whether, you know, in the multiracial community or, or anything like that. I mean, um, it's, it's sort of just, you know, people think, okay, when you think of people of faith, you think of Republicans, when you think of like, you know, baby eating demons, you think of Democrats, you know? So like, like what, 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 what is, what is your, your, uh, research, you know, show as far as how, how those people are voting and if there's a shift happening there as well. I think this is a super interesting question because it's actually maybe I'm going to go a direction maybe you're not expecting uh, with this because I think, yes, if you look at the community, there's a, a huge racial divide and divide by religion within the Democratic Party. And that black Democrats, you know, express as high levels of religiosity as white Republicans. Mm -hmm. And almost no one else in the Democratic side expresses that. I mean, and particularly if you break it, you know, you kind of zoom in on white, white Democrats and white college educated Democrats. I mean, I think there's something like a six to one <laughs> preponderance of black, you know, black Democrats who say, you know, religion is very very important in their lives, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's this huge divide. So it looms over things. What I would say that Trump did, though, you have to kind of go back before this moment where he kind of basically controls the Republican Party and has almost near universal loyalty among Republicans that are who obviously a very religious group. But you go back to the 2016 primaries and Trump, where Trump really cleaned up in that primary was among people who said, yes, I'm evangelical, but I don't attend church on a weekly basis. And that was a key dividing line where you had most of the evangelical leaders in the evangelical community who wanted initially, thought the thought was, uh, we want nothing to do with Trump. And then you've mm -hmm. got, all of a sudden, when Jerry Falwell Jr. comes out in, in, in favor of him, people are starting to like, why? Like, why would he come out in favor of this tri three times divorced playboy, right? I mean, that's just, <laughs> that's just strange. And I think what Trump really redefined, to some extent, Trump was able to realign many people, particularly in the white working class, who were not exclusively defined as like formal members of a particular denomination or faith that people who had either maybe called themselves evangelicals, but did not attend church frequently, or even maybe some folks who, you know, were not really very religious at all. I think he replaced, I think it, this, this old sense of the religious right dominating the Republican party. I mean, you go look back in the coverage of 2016, and he broke that, right? I mean, he broke that in terms of the religious right gatekeepers no longer really mattered. He was able to completely sign blind them despite having past positions on abortion that were very pro-choice. Um, and he was able to make some smart moves, like the Supreme Court, 
right, that, that really locked those voters in. But to sort of this idea has shifted, right? I mean, the populism on the right has shifted from being this very religious right-centric uh, movement to being a movement centered around, um, let's say, uh, more immigration, um, populist issue, working class populism, trade, globalization, um, these are the issues I think Trump moved to the forefront. And to some extent, I think they've displaced the old, uh, I think, moral majority issues that, you know, I think used to hold a Republican coalition together. Mm, yeah, that that is interesting. Yeah, we, we've, we've spoken to a number of, you know, people that watch this space very closely, um, like the, the PRRI, the Public, Re Public Religion... Public Research Religion Institute, <laughs> and they they came out with a, a pretty fascinating uh, survey they did with the Brookings Institute recently, which uh, was really phenomenal. Um, uh, but okay, so here's a question for you. Um, so you mentioned that you, just like every other pollster in the country, uh, were wrong in 2016, um, and um, I'll I'll be honest, I I don't think I'm alone in this. That you know, I've lost a lot of confidence in polls uh, because of that. Uh, and I understand it's a whole science and a science of which I don't understand, um, but, but I'll ask you about it. But, but I'm, but I'm curious, like what, what are some, what are some changes to your methods that you've, you've made um, to, to better predict or analyze kind of what's, what's going on in the country? I think that um, anybody who tells you they have the secret sauce or have the magic because <laughs> and, and what's interesting is that, you know, we talked a lot about 2016 polling error, and technically speaking, 2020 was worse. So in terms of hmm. it didn't get the winner wrong, right? I mean, generally said, all right, Biden is probably going to win. But remember the pre-2020 polls saying Biden's going to clean his clock. And that didn't happen. Yeah. And it was close enough such that Trump could claim that the election was stolen from him, that he could convince the vast majority of Republicans that he actually won. Right. I mean, it was it would have been a very different universe had the polls been right in 2020. We would not be ha probably having this conversation. I might not have written this book, <laughs> right, if the polls were actually right in 2022. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I think to me, the important thing is listening to within specific geographic areas and specific communities. So I mentioned doing polling down on the U.S.-Mexico border doing, um, you know, one of the things we did immediately after the 2016 election is we started polling these Trump country counties uniquely. Rather than doing this sort of broad national polls that kind of wash out, I think the voices of folks in specific communities really zooming in on what are the differences in priorities and issues um, from you know, Hispanics on the border to whites in rural America to folks in big cities um, and really trying to understand that from an issue standpoint as opposed to from a purely partisan standpoint, because I, I, I can't tell you that a lot of the partisan, you know, or horse race polling is automatically going to get better. I don't know if it's going to be actually any better in 2024. But I think that what we as pollsters can do is really listen better within specific communities that um, we may have missed in the past. Mm, interesting. So, so how do you, I guess how do you how do you become a better interpreter or consumer of polling information? Because I feel like I could find a poll that will you know, say that this podcast is the best rated podcast in all of America, but like, I know that is only partially true, you know? So like, um, how, how do I become a better consumer of, of polls? One thing when, as it relates to elections uh, that, that gets broadly misinterpreted. And I think because, uh, you know, people are taking shortcuts, polling is not getting any less expensive. It's not getting any less, e it's not getting any less, you know, it's not getting any easier. And so I think people can take whatever shortcut they can. And so what I, what, I, what I do think is important to remember is that um, we do not have a national election for president. We do not have a popular vote that decides who wins the presidency. 
and all the polls you're seeing are popular vote polls. In the last few elections, mm -hmm. you know, the median state, right, which would determine kind of 270 electoral votes, the tipping point state has been between two and four points to the right of the country. Now, will that continue in 24? There's no, there's no, like, there's no law that says that's going to continue, right, in 2024. It used to be the Democrats had this advantage. But I think partly because of how Trump reshaped the electorate in this more, with this more working class Republican coalition, that he had this huge, he had this hidden advantage, right, of having this more geographically advantageous coalition, right, going into 2020 that allowed him to almost win by, but for 70,000 votes in three states, uh, or even maybe even less, right, but to almost win the election despite losing the popular vote by 7 million. So I, I think that that would be one specific thing is pay attention to state polls and not national polls um, of 2024. Oh, interesting. Oh, that, that, that's, that's actually really, really good information. So, so like, um, I guess, what, what do you say to people? Cause I've heard this too, that, you know, um, I can't trust polls because I've never been polled. Um, and, and I, I, I get the sense, like, I, I don't, I don't well, know. They don't how, live in Iowa. Conduct polls, they, don't so live in Iowa. they don't live in New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Actually, the yeah. people that are saying this don't live there. Uh, yeah, and and like when when people are doing polls, is it all like through telephone? Is it yeah. through mail? Because like I feel like I've hung up on quite a few people that I thought maybe were trying to conduct a poll, but like I wasn't immediately sure, so I just hung up and then blocked their number. Uh, so so how, how how do people you know get oh, contacted for these polls? Super interesting question. But like more and more of it's online. So a lot of what polling we do is online, not all of it, but a lot of it. You have more and more online uh, polling to counteract, I think, a lot of the difficulties. Uh, it, it's getting very much harder and harder to reach people. The irony is of the folks who say, I've never been polled, is you probably haven't just like you, you're hanging up. So I think that um, in the 19, you know, in the 20th century, way to go back in the 20th century, 30% of people who were polled picked up the phone and answered the poll. Mm -hmm. Today, it's a fraction of a percentage point. As a result mm -hmm. of that, the just the math to do the poll, you have to call a lot more people. So, which means that you're actually probably getting polling calls all the time that are you're screening. Like, and you're not even even mm -hmm. in the consideration set for taking the poll or not, because <laughs> you actually probably have been polled and you don't even know it. Um, but I think that, that like, you know, in, in particularly this Iowa, uh, you know, example, um, my wife is from there. She gets calls all the time mm -hmm. or she gets it, you know, from be, having been on the, <laughs> on the voter file um, because pollsters are desperate, desperate to reach people um, who will actually talk to them. Mm, that's so interesting. Okay. So, um, so polling isn't just some magic, like pseudoscience. It's actually like a real thing that, that happens. Um, okay. <laughs> that's good. That's good to know. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so, you know, as we kind of wrap up here, like how, how can people learn more about you, follow you? Um, where can they buy your book? Um, you know, tell us a little bit about, about, you know, how, how to, how to market. Uh, sure. Um, so it's material. available on all platforms. So I'm sure you can go, you can go on Amazon, you can go wherever uh, books are sold and get your copy. Uh, I am Patrick Graffini. Uh, my name pretty much everywhere, uh, but uh, mostly on X, I guess we're calling it now. And uh, <laughs> it's yeah, Twitter. Twitter. Right. I'm not going to stop calling it. <laughs> <laughs> and on uh, patchgraffini.com is my newsletter. Mm. Yeah, and, and and you have a you have a Substack, right. uh, which which is really good actually. Like like I I've been reading it, and it it you you write it from the viewpoint of you know somebody that doesn't do this for a living so i really appreciate like your your writing style so uh but but patrick thank you so much for uh for joining us this has been a a, a pretty fascinating conversation the time went by really fast um and um i just appreciate all all the work you're doing and uh yeah any any predictions for uh for 2024 that you're I'm not in the you're brave I mean, to I'm make i'm not going to be in the business of doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>
That's probably good. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time. Really uh, glad to have you. And uh, to our listeners and viewers, uh, we will see you next week. Take care. Bye. All right. We stopped.